Good afternoon, everyone. We switch to English now in order to um, welcome all of you here in the audience and our wonderful panelists who are joining us from um, the virtual space. Um, my name is Manuela Wodka. I'm a sociologist here at the University of Freiburg, and I have the great pleasure of welcoming a great panel here today with uh, three wonderful speakers. And uh, I will introduce all of them in a moment. In case you were looking for the panel Decolonial Practices, this is it. Um, in a world shaped by colonialism, this is a big topic that um, I am sure our panelists will do a wonderful job of covering because they have not only many things in common in their work and their research, but also a lot to say about the subject that I think will weave a wonderful dialogue despite the physical distance. So we are talking about decolonial practices and their meaning in a world shaped by colonialism with um, Jasmine Muisi, with Jenna Marshall, and with Faisal Garba. And I am going to introduce them very briefly, um, but they will um, both add maybe to uh, my introduction as well as maybe use their speaking time to um, position themselves in addition to that introduction as they see fit. Um, starting with um, Jasmine Muisi, who is um, at um, the University of Siegen in Germany and is an assistant professor there with a research focus on racism, discrimination and social inequality, citizenship, um, migration and refugee movements, as well as qualitative methods of empirical social science. Welcome, um, Jasmine, and we're very much looking forward to your contribution. Our next speaker will be Dr. Jenna Marshall, who is also a, an assistant professor at the University of Kassel and uh, doing research in a critical perspective on international relations with a particular focus on empire and the reproduction of colonial global and uh, colonial global order in discourses on global governance. More broadly, she's interested in the global um, historical sociological inquiry, as well as the politics of the post-colonial and the development world, broadly on political economy. A very warm welcome, Jenna, and we're very happy to have you with us. Last but not least, my very dear colleague, Dr. Faisal Garba, who is a lecturer at the University of Cape Town, uh, where he co-directs the Global Studies Program, which is a program run in collaboration with um, our department at the University of Freiburg. He's a sociologist, um, very um, focused on and doing a lot of uh, research on African migration, social change, working class history and organization, African historical sociology and social theory. A very warm welcome to you, Faisal, and it's wonderful to have you on this panel with us. You might have already heard out of the very brief introduction how much our panelists have in common. Let's see now how they weave all of these topics together in order to shed light on this topic. I'm very much looking forward and it's a great privilege to be sitting here just getting to listen to them. So without further ado, I give you the floor starting with Jasmine Mouisi. Please, Jasmine, you have the floor. Thank you very much for uh, the introduction and for having me here um, this afternoon. And um, well, I would like to talk on the question what uh, decolonial practices I focus on. And in order to answer this question, I would like to, to use my present job as an example. And uh, first of all, I would like to talk about the critical whiteness trainings, workshops that I do. I offer spaces in which we learn to talk and think about racism. And these spaces are basically designed for white people, um, white people who might not yet have engaged with racism, especially their own internalized racism or who are at the very beginning of this journey. And uh, my aim is to engage white people in this conversation about racism. And we all know that critical whiteness dialogue 
is not what every white person wants to have, but I try to bring people to, yeah, to, to talk about it, even though I know it is not an easy topic and perspectives are different. And what is also important to mention for me is that I work with people who visit these workshops on a voluntary basis, which means nobody's forced to stay. They are free to leave at any time. And I'm definitely not on a mission to convince people of something. Um, I work with people, with white people who are ready and willing to start and to take this journey. People who want to find out what racism actually has to do with them. Um, because white people are not negatively affected by racism. And it is clear, it's obvious that racism has something to do with me, with Yasmin Muisi, with my life, sure. But the focus of my critical whiteness workshops is that the participants have the, um, let's say, opportunity to see and understand that they are also part of a racist system. And racism definitely has something to do with them. And they as well move and live in the system. And while Black, Indigenous, and people of color are being structurally disadvantaged, white people benefit, benefit from the same structures and receive privileges, white privileges, in the context of racism. And I try to offer a space in which white people can reflect on their own position in this society and also which re responsibility these positions bring with them. And when I, when I say responsibility, um, I mean to be aware of privileges that you have in the context of racism and also use these privileges responsibly. Um, and this is also what means decolonization for me in this context. First of all, to talk about racism. Um, we know that racism used to be a complete taboo in this country. It was almost unmentionable. And there were basically no incidents that were out called as racism, even though it happened all the time. And now we talk about it. Still, of course, I see a whole lot of fragility of derailing and these spaces are toxic, which makes this work very tough. But I also see people who are willing to take the confrontation and to learn and understand things and then the second thing, so this was about talking about racism. And then the second thing is that I try to support people to endure uncertainty. Um, in my workshops, I always meet people who want certainty from me. They want to know what words they are allowed to use, how they should behave, um, because I feel like they cannot endure the status of uncertainty. And they're also not used to this feeling, kind of. But um, this is something I can never and will not give them. So uh, let's put it this way. There's uncertainty on one side. But on the other side of uncertainty, there's the understanding that all of, of this is not a question of permission. It's not a question of me allowing people to use certain words. Um, it's the understanding that uncertainty does not lead to barriers in your head, does not, actually does not take away something from you. What really happens is they receive something and they receive an enlargement of, of knowledge. They start finally seeing things that have always been there because these are things that have always structured uh, the life and the world we live in. So I would say, yes, I irritate, I confuse people and actually, my goal is that the participants of my workshops leave this event with way more questions than they had at the start. Actually, if this is the case that I know I've done a pretty good job. Um, and then a third thing I would like to uh, mention is that I also try to support people to, to realize they learn some things wrong. Or to put it the other way around, I try to support them to start unlearning things. Um, especially when it comes to racism, many, many people have learned things wrong or wrong things. And the consequence is that there are so many myths surrounding racism. For example, that it is only connected to extremism. But racism is way more than this. 
And finally, um, I try to encourage uh, people to, how can I say this, to, to hang on, kind of to keep going. Because bottom line, they, they can decide when and how long they deal with this topic of racism, which is actually, actually a huge privilege. Um, and um, by far, one of my workshops is not enough. This is a lifelong process. Um, and then I would also like to talk about my perspective that, uh, that comes with me in this workshop, because I'm the person that prepares, that opens, that leads, that holds these spaces. And I move and speak in these workshops from a certain perspective the perspective of a person who experienced racism for over 31 years, who also experiences sexism, who also makes certain experiences with the way her body is shaped, and who also experiences all three of them at the same time, winded into each other. And this goes along with a uh, yeah, theoretical framing through my studies, through teaching and researching at the university, and the numerous workshops, talks, trainings, and so on that I did. I also bring the perspective of a light-skinned person, which means my mom is white, German, my father is a black Ghanaian. I come from, a, from an academic family. I speak also, which is very important to me, from the perspective of a mother, because especially in connection with racism, I find it unbelievable challenging to find a way to empower my three kids, to support them gaining a strong self-confident identity of Black people in this society. I'm also heterosexual, I'm cisgender, and why do I actually name all of these categories? Because, well, all of these, these are some categories that shape my perspective and the way I see the world and how I relate to this topic of racism and discrimination. Um, and none of us in, is in a neutral position. All of us perceive the world and people in this world from a subjective perspective. Um, so to conclude this uh, critical whiteness uh, workshops that I started with is, um, to me, it seems like the debates about racism are often white. And uh, white people take the right to talk and discuss about racism, to judge what racism is, what it is not. Um, also to tell us our emotions, feelings are wrong or inappropriate. Um, at the same time, ignore their own responsibility in all of this. And um, the fact that these debates have been white-dominated debates um, leads to, yeah, to my mind, leads to stopping change, improvement, progress, and solutions. And I believe it is important to claim these spaces and to raise my voice as a person who experiences racism as a Black German woman. And um, I also believe... Um, and I don't want this uh, to sound too, I don't even know the English word for that, kitschig. <laughs> but I um, believe that if people really understand what racism is and how it works, there is a possibility that we can come closer to each other as humans. That's what I'm committed to when it comes to critical whiteness. And then the, um, the second focus that I have in my work is empowerment. Um, critical whiteness is what I do on one side, and on the other side, I'm also an empowerment trainer. Um, and before working independently, I used to teach and research at the University of Siegen uh, for a couple of years. And for my PhD, I interviewed parents of Black children to find out what they do, what they can do to empower their children. And after leaving the uni, I started designing and offering empowerment workshops for Black people and people of color. And through the conversations with many of my interview partners, and even more through working with all these wonderful people in workshops, I um, realized more and more how I worked on this topic from a kind of bubble, academic bubble, and I felt like there was a, I really felt like there was a disconnection between me as a so-called expert and the real life, the reality. And I wanted my workshops to build like a bridge between theory on one side and practice on the other side. And I felt like the, um, uh, 
the university would not be uh, the right the right way for me to to reach this aim. Yeah, so I started developing these workshops where I want people to know the problem is not us, is not you, not the color of your skin, not the texture of your hair, the uh, not your name, not the place where you might have been born, but, but the problem is called racism. And um, I feel like many people who experience racism, which is so cruel and devastating, are almost used to hold back emotions like anger, rage, hurt, sadness, and um, kind of used to censor their stories, their experiences. And my empowerment spaces are there to generate safer spaces where people can, can talk about their stories and connect to others, where people can receive knowledge about the mechanisms behind racism that they face, where they can also explore other forms of discrimination that they are confronted with and that have an impact on their life. And they, they become visible as subjects and also their experiences become visible and are being heard, felt, acknowledged. And they get the opportunity to discover resources of resistance, to exchange about options, how to cope with racism, how to act. Um, so yeah, in these spaces, uh, I support people to explore, analyze and discover all this. And, I think at the end of the day, if we do not set up these spaces for us, nobody's going to do it for us. And um, I also work a lot uh, with Black parents. And I, through these workshops, I always see that there are so many things that parents do to raise anti-racist, to raise critical, to raise empowered, also feminist kids. And they may not label this as decolonial, but to me, this is exactly what it is. Um, to me, these are decolonial practices in a world shaped by decolonialism. And this shows that decolonial practices are not always obviously or loud. They can also happen behind doors in smaller individual contexts, but still can have a huge impact in the future. And here I would also like to make the comparison to resistance, because resistance against racism that does also not necessarily have to be a huge demonstration, for example. Resistance also means being confronted with, raci with racism, like a racist comment at work and going back to work the next day. Resistance also means being racial profiled by the police and going out on the street again. Resistance also means finding hope, feeling joy after Hanau, after George Floyd. Resistance means every laughing, hoping, working, loving, uh, living, being, breathing in this world that we live in. And um, this also leads me to the, to the term Schwarz with the capital letter S, um, which points out that Schwarz, the mention Schwarz, the Selbstbezeichnung in uh, the German language, is not about the color, like my, my shirt is black, but um, it, it shows an experience and a particular reality. It's not about the actual color of the skin, not about a certain amount of melanin, but about experiences in various sectors of the society. Um, when it comes to employment, housing, healthcare system, police, education, interaction with people. So, um, if we now transfer this back to decolonialization and then I'll be done, um, this can mean that decolonization today has many meanings. And to me, decolonization means way forward, means change, also resistance, means safer spaces, means black people coming together, centering ourselves and our experiences, having honest conversations. Um, decolonization means self-love, giving yourself time to rest and being good and patient with yourself. Um, it also means a space to grow, also power to speak up. And um, if I think about all the parents that I've been working with, decolonization means telling our children about our ancestors, about Black German and Black European history, about African achievements. Okay, so I would like to stop here and thank all of you for your attention.
Well, thank you so much, Jasmine, for such a powerful speech. Uh, I think everyone needs a moment to let all of these very rich meanings and examples and impulses sink in. But we really just take one moment before we switch to our next speaker. Let me just um, remind you to please um, Think of the questions you'd like to ask and keep them in mind or write them down if you want, because we'll discuss all of them after we've heard all of our three speakers. So now Jenna Marshall will uh, follow up. And um, please, Jenna, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Everyone can hear me? Good. Uh, Yasmin, I don't know if I can follow after you now. <laughs> That was a fantastic, fantastic presentation. And a lot of what I'll discuss as well actually flows into some of a lot of the themes that Yasmin spoke about. Um, so what I want to focus on today, I'll be looking to speak about schooling and schooling as a process of coloniality and how social movements, particularly pan-Africanist, social movements have sought to unsettle um, this coloniality of schooling. Um, so I'll take about 10, 10 minutes. I think I'll be a, a little bit shorter. But the first, I hope to chart out this relationship between schooling, empire, and race. And then secondly, I want to think through the meaning of decoloniality, as I mentioned, through uh, the power of social movements and specifically with their engagement to learning. So let's go back in time, right? The year is 1835. After the importation of some millions of Africans over previous 200 years, this population has dwindled to mere thousands scattered over the archipelago of the New World, known to us today as the Caribbean. This year follows on from a more auspicious year of 1833, where the British signed into law the Emancipation Act, granting to all, in, to all the enslaved manumission. This year, the British government earmarks, so they earmark the, for the first time financial provisions specifically for the education of Africans in the Caribbean, in the British Caribbean dispersed through the Negro Education Grant of 1835. But it's for the exclusive use for the mobilization of, quote, religious and moral education of the Negro population, end quote. So earlier forms of education could be found in the colonies in the New World, right? But this is predominantly through missionary bodies or philanthropic donations of plantation owners. However, the significance of this 1835 act is that it's the first ever demonstration in the prioritization of schooling as an institution of empire vis-a-vis -vis its African population. It is not a coincidence then, the intertwined colonial and racialized relationships between the imperial imperatives and the nature of formal schooling. Victorian era novelist and prominent colonial apologist, Anthony Trollope, expressed in no uncertain terms, and I quote, education has yet done much for the black man in the Western world. He can always observe oft and often read, but he can seldom reason. I do not mean to assert that he is absolutely without mental power as a calf is, he does draw conclusions, but he carries them only a short way. I think that he seldom understands the purpose of industry, the object of truth, or the results of honesty. And I end quote. Here we see quite ostensibly from Trollope a comparison of Africans to animals. And although not talking animals, Africans are considered as perpetually afflicted in their ability to reason. And as a result, they are foreclosed from the realm of producing valuable 
and legitimate knowledge, as well as for the ensuring of a responsible citizenry. And it's such foreclosure that can be witnessed through the banking model of teaching. And attributed to the work of famed Brazilian educator Paulo Fieri, he explains this approach as an act of depositing, in which students are the depositaries and the teacher is a depositor. Instead of communicating, the teacher issues communiques and makes deposits, in which students patiently receive, memorize, and repeat. The scope of action allowed to the student extends only as far as receiving, filling, and storing the deposits. They do, he acknowledged, have the opportunity to become collectors and catalogers of the things they store, but he offers that ultimately it is men themselves who are filed away through a lack of creativity, transformation, and knowledge in this misguided system, and I end quote. But also what I find interesting with Fierre's work is that he alerts us that within this doctrine of the banking model of education, knowledge is considered a gift bestowed by those who consider themselves knowledgeable, in this case, the West and the Western male subject, upon those whom they consider to know nothing. Projecting an absolute ignorance, Fiere says, onto others is a characteristic of an ideology of oppression, which negates true education and knowledge as processes of inquiry." End quote. So for me, schooling becomes an act, sorry, schooling acts as a process of coloniality responding through an institutionalization of subalternizing non-Western people. So I'll repeat that because it, it was a bit jumbled. I haven't found another way of saying it, <laughs> right? But it's an institutionalization of subalternizing non-Western people. The Western subject is understood as possessing the epistemic authority to substantiate truth, not the African. And the act of depositing knowledge perceives Africans and their descendants, and I'm speaking in the context of the New World in the Caribbean, they, these peoples are considered as vessels. These peoples are objects. So this objectification and perception of emptiness is illustrative in the negation of, the, of African subjectivity, of African subjecthood. And during the Negritude movement, Amy Césaire famously equated colonization as equaling thingification. The essence of this equation was the loss of human being status on the part of the African subject. And his descendant is reduced to pure facility, concealed in his eminence, cut off from his future, deprived of his transcendence. The human being no longer appears anything more than a thing among things, end quote. So it is this understanding of negating which functions, I argue, to uphold a dependency of non-Western peoples on Western systems of knowledge through the dominant discourses as well as the institutional practices of formal schooling. So... The process of schooling and education and the systems of education they institute should not be considered as neutral. In its simplest terms, Michael Apple tells us that knowledge is power and the circulation of knowledge is part of a social distribution of power. The means and ends involved in education policies and practices constitute therefore a sustained struggle against colonialism underpinned by a liberation ethics for a genuine emancipation. In this vein, social movements can be considered as one of several act actors who demand accountability for those who hold power, imperial or otherwise, and to dismantle 
the scholar, the, 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 the pedagogical arrangements of empire. All right, so what we're thinking about here is how empire arranges social life and this, the, the school is one of its key institutions in that arrangement of empire. So in my, for the next few minutes now, I would like to speak just really briefly, just sketch out one such movement that I believe has been laboring towards unsettling this colonial logic of schooling. And to piggyback on Yasmin's point, how, um, how many of these movements that are engaged in these decolonial practices don't necessarily call themselves decolonial. And I think there's a, a power in that, right? The, 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 the quiet revolution, the quiet resistance, I think is, is really key to understanding um, uh, this, these systems and, and their meaning. So earlier I spoke of how through British colonial legislation, the African in the New World transitions from enslaved and property to a colonial subject. So now I would like to offer how through social movements, they've envisioned alternative projects away from coloniality through schooling as a way of creating the citizen, right? And notably, I look at Pan-African activists in the Caribbean, who over the years, and some might say centuries, particularly if we look at the Marcus Garvey movements um, in the early 20th century, sought to mobilize people of African descent to challenge dominant structures um, that continue to exploit and oppress the majority populations of the Americas. And this is not to discredit other social movements that have emerged in the region over a similar period. However, in terms of their mobilization, there is no other comparable movement in the uh, Caribbean region, particularly amongst its Afro-descendant populations. So I just want to chart out the work of one particular, so one particular organization um, called the Commission for Pan-African Affairs. And they, in twin, in, while I was on field work in 2013, they've essentially set up an African-centered teacher training program uh, as part of the continued process of decolonization. And they, they've noted that they seek to cultivate Iwapele, the Yoruba phrase for the noble and gentle character acquired by elders with wisdom. And this is what they want to disseminate amongst their um, the trainee teachers. So this program, um, it's known as the Mabalozi program, and it's a voluntary program. And the tenets of these program is to promote and develop um, Afrocentric consciousness and values amongst their students and through their schools. So their commitment extends to ensuring to whatever degree possible, the incorporation of specific texts, teaching as well as teaching um, approaches or pedagogical tools uh, necessary for Afrocentric development into the curriculum, reading lists and the teaching culture of the schools. Uh, in particular, the organization works with several indigenous African and grassroots activists, um, which actively seek to resist um, the European coloniality of knowing, right? As I mentioned earlier, that quote from Trollope, this idea that the African cannot reason and how this logic has filtered into and been institutionalized within education systems in the Caribbean. This Mabalozi program is seeking to unsettle that logic, right, of a European coloniality of knowing. And in particular, 
they so in particular they have workshop series that run throughout the year and some of the topics were understanding the root causes of low self-esteem in our children again yasmin she mentions this idea about self-esteem and confidence and this is one of the key themes that run throughout this um these training programs so the teachers here within this Mabalozi program are repositioned as social justice activists whose clear aims are the demythologizing of Africa. And in interviews with the director of the program, he really made that clear. He wanted, and what do I mean by demythologizing Africa? Simply put, he wanted this idea of Africa as this troublesome area in perpetual need of intervention to be contested. Right. Moreover, the director and committee, they've sought to provincialize Europe and decenter it as the standard bearer of creation and civilization. And this, uh, they argue, is a key strategy in building the self-esteem of children of African descent. This approach sought to ensure a dismantling, therefore, on the reliance of Europe, European knowledge frames in order to produce legitimate knowledge. So in other words, legitimate knowledge is not simply produced through a mimicry of Europe, but can be found elsewhere. And I'm just going to close um, talking about how they have departed from the traditional conceptualization of the classroom. And for the Mabalozi, the classroom is considered a crucible of care. So as such, special attention is given to encouraging teachers to design projects that build self-esteem and confidence in their students. And this process is fortified through the studying of alternative epistemes, epistemes, epistemology, sorry, knowledge systems. The studying of African histories, African origins of civilization, the diverse African origins of Caribbean peoples, uh, African spirituality, and so forth. So with a significant focus on African history and cultural practices, teachers are effectively trained in utilizing African-derived concepts across disciplines currently taught in schools. And this is to, to, uh, to construct a positive, but also a universally applicable, uh, sorry, a universally applicability of African-based values. So in closing, the banking model that I mentioned earlier, critiqued by activist scholars like Paulo Fiere, is premised on the emptiness of students and particularly the emptiness of students in the global South, right? waiting to be filled with the wisdom of the West. So what is at stake, therefore, for Pan-Africanist scholars is the disruption of these pedagogical practices and the mobilizing of students' own social capital imbued through their own lived experiences as well as their African heritage. And it is here where I believe a decolonial ethos can be observed and should be prioritized. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Jenna. And again, here, I think we need a moment to let um, all of this um, kind of also very long-term narrative plus a uh, kind of long-term history permeate our minds and, and bodies and the feelings that it kind of ar arise, um, arouses in, I think, everyone who can relate. Um, so giving everyone that moment, let me remind you at this point that um, after the third um, speech, um, I will ask you to um, maybe react to each other briefly before we open the discussion, um, but really briefly so we have enough time to engage with the audience and uh, make it a real dialogue across um, space, virtual space and physical space. 
And with that, it is my pleasure to uh, make a virtual leap from Germany to South Africa, from Freiburg, Kassel, and Siegen to Cape Town, and give the floor to my colleague, Faisal Garba. Faisal, you have the floor. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Manuela. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Am I audible enough? OK, thank you very much, Manuela. Uh, thanks to the organizers of uh, Dear White People for the invitation. Uh, I would have loved to be in Germany, but the almighty Corona has decided otherwise. Uh, so I'm seated here in Cape Town. Uh, and, and thanks to, to, to Jenna and to um, uh, uh, Yasmin you know, for, for really stimulating presentations. So I'm just going to try and uh, do two things um, within the 15 minutes that I have. I will try and uh, look at two cases from Africa where activists who were struggling against colonialism were trying to, at the same time, build a different kind of society by dealing with the question of quote unquote racial identity in movement building. And what do you do in a society which is marked deeply by racism, by colonialism, as a, a, a stop gap towards a new kind of society? <clears throat> now, these examples are drawn from South Africa, from apartheid South Africa, and from Tanzania, you know, uh, the, the immediate aftermath of colonialism in Tanzania, so in the, in the, in the early 1960s. Um, so let's begin from South Africa. Um, <clears throat> Yasmin spoke about, you know, race not as this biological entity, but as a lived experience, as an experience. And I think that for me is the starting point. Um, the core of apartheid um, really was the notion that human beings constitute distinct biological races, and that these races, in a sense, determine our psychological uh, uh, wirings, our desires, and our aptitudes. Accordingly, we have to live in societies based on this natural racial classifications. If not, something natural is being disrupted. Okay, So that is the primary thesis. For that reason, apartheid South Africa had a, a hierarchical, an ordinal hierarchy uh, basically, so you have whites at the top, then you have Indians, and you have a group that are part of South Africa called colored. So this would be people, you know, either of, of, of Malay, of, of, of um, uh, 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 mixed heritage, and then you have African. African would be, you know, people that look like me, for example, right? Um, <clears throat> of course, whites were at the top and blacks were at the bottom. Each group had to live in a separate area, and this was codified as part of something called the Groups Areas Act. It became a criminal offense for a person who was, say, colored to be found in an Indian area or for a black person to be found in, in a white area. But never mind the fact that white households were being serviced you know, by African women. So, so that's an important thing to, to bear in mind as we, we proceed. The anti-apartheid movement proceeded from this logic and organized based on the notion of separateness. So you had groups made up of white liberals who were opposed to aspects, and I insist aspects of apartheid, because it did not conform to classical liberalism. You then have people who were active in something called the Indian Congress. You all remember Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi, in a sense, was one of the, 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 the he prefigured you know, that, that movement. Um, then there was the African National Congress, you know, led by Mandela, um, Boratambo, and co. Um, in these groups, membership followed the apartheid classification. So people who were called African were in the African National Congress. People who were classified as Indian were, were in the Indian Congress, and, and, and so on. Now, each of these groups purportedly wanted to defeat apartheid, but they are accepted the colonial definition of races as biologically distinct and different in their aptitude, and therefore struggled differently. Now, by the mid-1960s, most of the leaders of these groups were in prison, right? So they were in Robben Island, you know, long 
term jail sentences. And there was almost a lull by the late 60s, early 70s in the anti-apartheid struggle. But then a group of young women and young men came onto the scene and described themselves as the Black Consciousness Movement. So the Black Consciousness Movement refused the idea, the apartheid idea, which classified people based on biology, purportedly as whites, Indian, colored, and African. <clears throat> so they saw apartheid as an institution built on colonialism, which was deeply you know, linked with, of course, economic exploitation, but what they call a mindset of submission. And that, that is really important. And for them, this mindset of submission is best represented by the acceptance of these given racial groups. For them, society was not made up of distinct biological races, but society was made up of a group of the oppressed and those that are oppressed. The oppressed here for them constitute what they call the blacks. So the black here included people that you call Indian under the apartheid classification, or people that you call colored, or people that you call African. They were black and oppressed not because of how they looked, but because of their position in the, in, in, in the production of value. And therefore, their experiences mirrors that of the oppressed, and therefore, they call them black. They contrast that with what they call the white power structure. And the white power structure here, of course, included the states. It included you know, those who wanted to see changes, you know, minor changes in the apartheid uh, structure and those who were very comfortable with it, all right? Now, it's important that in their definition of the Blacks, they are not sympathetic to, say, African elites who were collaborators in apartheid. Now, that is an interesting one. And parts of the group that they considered theirs included comrades of theirs who were leftists and radicals and happened to be whites. Now, what does this mean? I think for me, the first thing is that it means that decolonization has to undo colonial frames and outlook, especially when it comes to identity and political action and solidarity. And why was this important? Because in the case of South Africa, apartheid classification was not an idle thing. Yes, it was meant to head labor into the mines and plantations, but it was also designed to undercut opposition and solidarity, right? By people who are placed in similar circumstances, but who might look differently, but their everyday realities are very much the same. And so thinking through what the frame is as the basis for developing apartheid was for them the first thing. And the second step would be, how do you concretely bring about a situation that, 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 that undercuts you know, this logic of apartheid? Now, I'll quickly move to the second example and then try and, and, and ground this further. Um, the second example is, is Tanzania. Um, and we're speaking via um, Zoom to Germany. And <laughs> so it's important to locate Germany. Of course, the idea is that you know, German colonialism was brief. Um, you know, um, by the end of the First World War, it was all confiscated. And so it wasn't really impactful, right? But, but the reality, though, is that German colonialism had very profound impact in terms of the groundwork of, col of, of, of colonial classification in East Africa and in Tanzania in particular. So eugenics, which was a major movement in, 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 in certain circles of, of, of German academia, um, was highly practiced in Tanzania. So Eugen Fischer, who was a professor at the University of Freiburg, um, said, for example, that the natives should only be supported to the extent that they're economically useful. Afterwards, they should be allowed to be exterminated by competition. Now, how did this transpire on the ground? It transpired by, again, the ranking of the natives 
initially based on races. You had the Asians, the whites, the Africans. And then within the Africans, you then begin to classify so-called tribes. So by the time the British took over from, from the Germans, they were very much in a position uh, to, to, to make very minor changes to the uh, indirect rule principles because of what the Germans had already put in place. And this was the structure, basically. You had Europeans at the top, just like in South Africa, then you had Asians, then you had Africans. Now, the mode of rule was of differentiated codes. So you had a legal code for Europeans, a legal code for Asians, and a legal code for the different so-called African tribes. The anti-colonial movement uh, called the Tanzanian African National Union understood that if they want to overcome colonialism outside of you know, doing away with direct formal rule, then one has to undo the basis of colonial rule. Okay, that, that for them was, 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 was important. And how do you undo that? They thought that the first thing you needed to undo was the basis of identity. Okay, and so you needed to create a uniform code which saw citizenship not as a product of origin, but as a product of, 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 of residency, of, of social change. They therefore redefined the idea of African from a destiny to a process. Okay, you therefore had an African of European ancestry, an African of Asian ancestry, an African of an African ancestry. That for them was not a contradiction because that is how societies shift. Societies are never static. Doing away with the conflation of place and identity was very important because European ideas about the world that colonialism you know, uh, uh, transmitted was one which saw a people as having a natural space. And therefore, certain people who come to that place are artificial to the place. It's almost like you know, people are planted, basically. That, 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 was, that, was, that was the idea. And so for, 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 for the movement, one had to take account of the reality that prior to colonialism, the Indian Ocean was a major as axis of movement, of trade, of the exchange of people. So if you go to Zanzibar, right, you see people from across you know, the Indian Ocean that have been intermeshing for generations. So it's difficult to say who is Shiraji, who is, who, who is, who is, who is, who, who, who is not Shiraji, right? Because people have, have mixed. And therefore, for them, colonialism tried to separate these things. Colonialism tried to separate them by taking racial identity as something out there, as, 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 a, as a law of nature. And so if one wants to create a different kind of society, then one has to undo the basis of this. It's not just about changing a flag and having a new constitution. It's about having a new basis of social life. Now, why is this important? And why is it important for us today, you know, speaking from, 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 from Freiburg? I think it asks questions of us in our activisms. And, and the first really is, what kind of world do we want to build, right? So this is a world which is marked by colonialism, by incredible racism. But is it possible to see the outlines of another kind of society, another kind of world, in the struggle against this racist, this colonized world? Is that possible? Now, I think it's possible from the examples of these, of these movements. And for me, what is central here is that we do not proceed from the framings, from the outlooks, and from the classifications. So what I'm trying to say, just to be clear, is that racial identities, of course, the effects are there, they are real, right? But is it possible for us to think of a different kind of world where they do not form the starting point for us? So, so what I'm trying to say here is that this movement gave us the example that that is absolutely possible. So in the case of, 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 of South Africa, the Black Consciousness Movement completely showed the, the lack of social depth, the lack of hegemony of apartheid, okay? That essentially it was a brutish uh, uh, system, but it had no depth because it was trying to re-engineer society away from the reality of intermeshings, from the reality that 
almost every single white person in South Africa who is 40, who is 30 years and above was raised by a black woman. Almost every. Right? And so, 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 so how do you connect this reality to the fact that these people are supposed to be in different natural worlds and are supposed to move into, into these, 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 these natural worlds? And therefore, if one is organizing today, the key question is, is it possible to work with people across, quote unquote, racial identities in a deeply colonized and continuously colonizing world while beginning from the human, the, 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 the notions of commitment of what people are committed to, what they seek to achieve collectively with us as opposed to who they are? For, for me, these are questions that this movement raise. And these questions are important, and I'll stop here because I think my time is, is almost up. This these questions were important for us at the University of Cape, Cape Town in 2015, where, of course, roads fell. We had a brooding uh, 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 statue of Cecil Rhodes, a major colonialist and imperialist, you know, you know atop uh, the central square of our campus, and the students toppled it. And the question of how do we move from here? What kind of a campus do we want to build? What center stage? Do we want to build a Blacks-only campus? We want to build a campus, as Franz Fanon said, that decolonization must create a different human. That that different human has to only arrive if we are able to, and this is this is deadly, and it doesn't mean it doesn't mean literal, but this is what he says. This is Fanon's word, not mine. That the black and the white person must die for the new human to be born, but not die physically, but the power structure that underpin one and the disadvantage that undergets the other must cease to exist. Thank you very much. Very many thanks, Faisal. And um, the thing about uh, moments that we need to let these messages sink in is that they also accumulate after three speeches so that uh, we need uh, maybe a deeper moment to think about that. I don't know how everyone is, but I'm uh, having a blast. It, this is a wonderful time and there's no other place I'd rather be right now than um, thinking with these brilliant minds here, although the light is glaring and the room is otherwise very dark. But um, this being said, thank you very, very much to all three of our speakers. And I would suggest we take just a few minutes for you to react to each other, um, if you want. Um, and then we can open up for discussion. And we need to um, close at uh, 5.45 in order for people to have time to switch buildings and get to the keynote, which is amazing given that fact that there's even a phys physical place to go to and switch to rather than a different Zoom room. So does anyone want to react to each other's speech or who wants to start rather? Speaking about moments. Okay, like, let, let, let me go. Let me break the ice. <laughs> please, we can reverse the order. Yeah. That's good. Very <laughs> So, um, um, Yasmin, I, I, I wanted to, to begin from, um, you know, your um, positioning, you know, the way you position yourself, you know. Um, for, for me, that, that was really interesting because it, it, it shows the complexity of of, of our lives, right? Um, um, and how we are um, involved in different, you know, things, but also how this, the, there's no position of absolute purity, you know? And, and for me, that's important that, that activism and thinking about a new world, it's, 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 it's a work in pro, uh, pro, progress. It's, it, it's about um, openness. Um, it's about trying, it's about understanding our complicities at times in, in, in different structures of oppression. Uh, and for me, that's really interesting because it, it politicizes questions that at times people moralize. And for me, that's important, that these are political questions, you know, and, 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 and political questions are, are, are things to be negotiated, to be thought through, you know, to, to, to be historicized. 
uh, and then we begin to see that 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 um, uh, 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 the, the 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 human condition, you know, um, is 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 precarious in, in in many in many in many in many levels. For me, that's really really important, and I really appreciate that, you know. Um, and and I just want to come to 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 Yasmin's. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Yena's point, um, you know, about um, education. Um, you, you know. There's a guy called Suleiman Bashir um, uh, uh, Jen, um, who, who, who is in Columbia um, University. And, you know, Suleiman Bashir has written a book um, recently on um, philosophy. And he's looking at, you know, the height of, 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 of Baghdad, you know, um, and the connection between Baghdad and, you know, parts of West Africa, um, like, like, like Timbuktu. Um, but also parts of what you call India today. And, and his point is about how people moved across the world in search of knowledge. People wanted to learn. They never thought of this thing called, you know, this, this, is, this is a place-based knowledge. This is, this is European philosophy. This is, this is African uh, mathematics, you know. But something happened. Something happened, you know, the, the decisive 17th century, the rise of <laughs> this, this imperial Europe, and therefore the idea to, uh, to, to appropriate what really had been, you know, a, a human uh, 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 contribution. Uh, and for me, that's interesting, the fact that you had, and, and I'll stop here, I promise, Manuela. Um, so, so if you take, there's this guy called uh, Wilhelm Anton Amu, you know, who, 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 who was gifted as, as a gift to the Duke of Braunschweig, educated in Germany, studied in Halle. And it's interesting, if you read when he was graduating with his PhD, the, the UNI president said, you know, you know, Herr Dr. Amu from Guinea, there's people who were known for, 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 for the love of learning and so on. But by the time Amu moved to Jena, the climate in Germany had shifted. And now the people from Guinea were not known for knowledge, they were savages, <laughs> you know, within a lifetime. And so, so for me, this is interesting, you know, this, this, this um, opportunistic positioning that some people know, some people don't know, but at some point they knew, now they don't know, right? So, so, and, and so that knowledge, it's not this objective thing that is out there. It's something that keeps being instrumentalized for, for different purposes. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks, I will stop here. Thank you, Faza. Yasmin, Jenna, do you wanna answer? Or react to something else as well? So I will join in if that's fine for you, Jenna. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for your presentations. I've learned a lot, very interesting. Um, and when well, you started uh, referring to the categories um, that I was talking about, and um, what I would like to add is that to me, it is important to, to mention all of these categories because um, it shows I am also part of the game. <laughs> I am also involved in this system, not only when it comes to racism, but I also have privileges in different uh, contexts. Um, and yeah, this is what I wanted to add and to, to make clear why I find it very important to be aware of these categories. And of course, this is not a, uh, a static thing. It's, as you said, society is dynamic, identities, our language is, um, we are all moving the whole time. But I think um, these are categories in this Western world that I live in that are, uh, can lead to, to um, that you profit from things or that you are um, in a position of uh, disadvantage. Yeah. Thank you, Jasmine. Um, oh, sorry. Yes, um, I, I'm just, I'll echo Manuela. I, there's no other place I'd be right now. This is really fantastic. Um, I was, I was actually interested, Yasmin, when you, and I made a note here, you said white people are not negatively affected by racism. And I, I kind of wanted to push back on that a bit because the, 
the idea that one is privileged in a system of of brutality to me is not that much of a privilege it, it, or I didn't say that in as eloquently as I would like, but I just felt as though to the point of creating a new world and Faisal using quite aptly that quote from Fanon, the idea of the black man and the white man must die in order for the human to emerge, it means that whiteness as well as blackness also carry a certain burden right? It carries a particular burden because the system of racialization is a system marked by death, right? And I was just wondering how you, if you perhaps think that, you know, that whiteness can be redeemed, you know what I mean? Like, can, is it, I don't know, maybe I'm not explaining it very well, but I just felt, I don't know, that this idea that whites are not negatively affected by racism could, I don't know. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I'm just having a little bit of a, a brain fart at the moment. But yeah, I, I just, I don't know why, but that just kind of like stood out for me. But um, I really appreciate it when you talked about this idea of not asking permission, like in the workshops and how you're not there to just placate others, but really for people to sit in their discomfort. I thought that was really, really powerful. And for Faisal, it was really interesting how you talked about colonialism and this, the idea of the separation of peoples into this a natural state of things and really how colonialism is underpinned by an ideology of fragmentation, right? It works through the creation of, of differences. But I'm also interested in this idea of like, how do we then create a, a, a new social life if particularly arrangements are made in a way that foreclose peoples from being citizens, right? So like, so why I talked about this idea of like, well, if the African can't reason, then the African cannot be a citizen because he cannot participate. And I was just interested in like, how you think about that, this idea of the citizen in the creation of this new social life. But yeah, those are my thoughts. <laughs> well, I think it's great to, um, kind of close the reaction that you have to each other by a series of questions, because then we've reached uh, Jasmine's goal of uh, raising more questions at the end of a, um, a kind of thought-provoking talk than kind of providing ready-made answers. And at the same time, if you start with a round of questions, maybe that's the best way to start also engaging our audience. So um, I suggest we collect um, some questions and then um, you can react to um, what has just been said by the other panelists uh, and or to the questions um, in whatever order you then wish. So who has had time to let thoughts think in, formulate, and wants to share them with us. Um, because of corona, we cannot circulate mics, so you have to speak up, and then I'll try to relate the question to um, our panelists. Uh, hopefully, I understand it. So, um, Faisal, the question was, after the toppling of um, Cecil Rhodes' statue, um, what are plans for um, kind of building on that? The, the question said rebuilding the university, but only the statue was toppled, the university still... Right. <laughs> so, I don't know, maybe um, the idea of different statues or different um, kind of contextualizations instead of Rhodes' statue. Was that... Okay. No, okay. Mm -hmm. So the idea was that um, schooling as uh, not mimicking European uh, forms of knowledge and of, of teaching was very interesting. And the question was, um, in Europe, there's this understanding of how uh, knowledge built into education has been um, kind of transmitted from the ancient Greeks to today. So what would be the basis 
for a decolonial understanding of a schooling or a, a system of education that does not just um, piggyback on that, if that is an accurate summary. So, so I, I, I only, after you talked about the ancient Greeks and then I... So what would be a decolonial way of undoing this kind of understanding of education and of transmitting knowledge in a linear way from the ancient cradle of civilization to today? It's an easy question, obviously. <laughs> Sorry, joking. It's, it's, it's very complex and it would um, kind of earn its own podium, but maybe you can um, give a succinct answer. So let's keep it at these two and then uh, we'll come back and uh, collect more questions. Faisal, do you want to start? Since you've had more time to think about the question. Okay, okay, cool. Uh, thanks. Uh, um, so so when, when the um, Rhodes um, statue was um, toppled, um, th there were a number of considerations that were put forward. Um, you know, you had um, a group that had advocated um, <laughs> a kind of um, a colonial museum on campus. <laughs> so um, indeed, one of my colleagues um, had this joke. They said, OK, the easiest thing is you create a plaque in front of the university and you just say, this is a living colonial relic, you know, um, just to say that. Um, but, but more seriously, um, what happened was um, the university was pushed by the student movement to um, embark on a process, on a university-wide consultative process um, around names, around monuments. Um, and so uh, the, the main university hall used to be named after a guy called Jamison. Jamison was the, the war commander of Rhodes, was the one that led the expeditions to Zimbabwe and all the massacres over there. Uh, so, so last year, the Jamison Hall was named after Sarah Batman, you know, so we all know Sarah Batman. Um, and uh, um, many um, other buildings, you know, are now being renamed as um, part of the work of a committee. A committee was set up, you know, to look into these things. But of course, some of the students uh, protest, and I, I think I understand why, um, about institutional capture. Um, you know, that um, this could freeze the movement, you know, and basically make it a bureaucratic question. Uh, but also, there's another debate that others raise about the very politics of memorialization. You know, that if you, you, you freeze history, you, 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 you uh, memorialization also, in a sense, individualizes struggle, you know, so it's about this one great person, Mandela or whoever. Um, so, 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 so there are all these debates happening, but I will say now the more dominant position is that of renaming. You rename buildings. Um, you, you, uh, for example, there's nothing, no contextualization still, you know, on the road statue is just empty. You know, there's nothing, nothing there. Uh, um, but there's this process of, of renaming places on, on campus. Um, yeah, so I think, I think I will, that's where I'll stop, yeah. Thank you, Faisal. Jenna? Yes, um, the ancient Greeks, that's really, it's quite interesting. And, and through my research, I've, I've come across repeatedly, particularly how ancient Greece and Rome are mobilized in colonial education. It's as, like as a marker, as a signifier of, of, of knowledge. And thinking back to Fieri, how he talks about you know, how you could become a cataloger of great knowledge, but you can't actually produce it yourself. And I think that's what this Greek, this ancient Greek and Roman history does, right? It's, it's the signifier of civilization. And it's also used not only in the invention of this cohesive Europe, right? Which we know um, wasn't the case um, prior uh, to the 15th century, but also it acts as a transmission of whiteness, right? Um, so, I so in terms of this idea of how uh, ancient Greek and Roman history are mobilized, 
I would ask what then is the purpose of schooling? What is the purpose of education? And for a lot of the Pan-Africanist activists, it's really about a type of enlightenment of African people um, to, to, sub, to, to, to subvert or to redress their subjugation, but they also then use Africa. And for many people, I think Africa is then essentialized, right? So you have like this, this thing called Africa, you know, I wear my dashiki and whatever, and it becomes very performative. No, <laughs> Faisal's laughing, but it becomes, he's laughing because he's like, I know that. But it becomes very performative. And I think for some quarters within Pan-Africanism, what Africa as an imagined space seeks to do, which is not the same way in which ancient Greek and Rome is trying to do, it's, it's trying, it's seeking a redemptive ethos. It's seeking to redeem those who have a history of subjugation, a history of negation. Um, and that's how I would answer the question, like how you then try to, to redress um, this, this, this role of, of, of Greece and, and Rome. And just really, really briefly, really quickly, in the archive, it's, it's quite interesting. Many of uh, the colonial students in Asia, in Africa, in the Americas, the uh, co the British Colonial Committee, sorry, the British Committee for Colonial Education in the colonies, I know very long. They said we must teach the natives ancient Greece. You know, we must teach them this. This is the only way through which that they can understand. The, the only way that they can uh, be imbued with civilization. Uh, so. I wouldn't then say don't teach ancient Greece, but my question would be, what is the purpose? How are you seeking to 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 engage with with Greece? Um, is it as a, the as the sole purveyor of wisdom and truth and beauty? Um, then I think that's problematic. But the 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 my answer isn't to remove ancient Greece, but to situate it alongside other um, cultures, other civilizations. And if I may add, um, it was um, also helped to not essentialize it, right? Because the what was taught about ancient Greece was that uh, this is part of whiteness, which is premised on not seeing uh, the Mediterranean uh, trade circles, not seeing the Persian and the Arabic and all the black contributions to ancient Greek being uh, ancient Greek <laughs> and, and uh, all the scientific kind of contributions um, as well. So Black Athena, I think, is a very decolonial. Martin Bernal's uh, book, Black Athena, of how actually um, Athens was very much uh, also black and not white European is a good place to start. Um, Jasmine, do you want to add anything to this? Do you have any thoughts? This was not uh, particularly directed at you, but maybe you want to intervene? Otherwise... No, I, not at this point. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Right. So um, Jasmine talked about empowerment um, workshop for um, parents. And the question is whether you also have um, ideas or trainings for uh, parents who are raising black kids white parents who are raising black kids, was that it? Right. So we talked about decolonization and stuff, but um, the question would be, how can this be achieved in Africa? Even countries that are considered independent in Africa um, have colonial institutions, and some countries in Africa are still paying colonial tax to France, so how can this be decolonized? So in this case, I would suggest, um, oh, if we have another question, th these were two actually, but if there's one more, yes, please. A question for Jasmine, yeah? Okay, so the question is um, about critical whiteness workshops, whether these are not centered around um, white people uh, and um, kind of around um, 
discussing white guilt and whether there's a possibility of going beyond this and um, beyond individual kind of um, experience or solutions. Was that correct? Okay. So now, Jasmine, if you'd like to start, you have two concrete questions to yourself and then um, the general one. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you for the questions. Um, so the first question, um, it's not the first time that <laughs> this question is uh, being asked or that I come across this question. Um, and I, I think what is important to, to do is start with yourself. Um, start um, educating yourself on this very complex topic and um, start thinking about your own position and, and your own, uh, um, your own the, the language you use, the thoughts you have and, and why you have these thoughts. This is actually um, also refers to the second question. It's it's not about thinking that I am not supposed to think this way. It's a bad, bad, uh, this is a bad thought. I, it, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's forbidden. It's not a question of this. The question is, why do you think this way? I'll give you an example. I had an interview partner, a white woman who said she, um, she always checks her purse if she's in a how's it, elevator, no lift, lift is off, okay, right? In a lift with a, with a black person. And she felt very guilty for that. And I would say, this is not a question of guilt. You need to think, you need to analyze, find out why you think this way. Um, and um, what, what kind of images, what kind of education you, you received during your life to, um, to get these certain pictures inside your head and to develop these thoughts. Um, so to come back to the question, start with yourself, focus on yourself. And um, I always work a lot with teachers and people who work in school, and they also they always um, complain that their students are not um, behaving in the way they want them to behave. They complain that they, there's a lot of discrimination going on um, during the break time, for example. And what I always say is that the teachers, <laughs> they should also focus on themselves because I truly believe if teachers start um, behaving anti-racist, then the, the children will have a, a role model, an opportunity to see things. If teachers position themselves, if racist or other, discriminate, uh, other discrimination happens, they can learn from that. And this can have an impact on them and the way they see the world. Um, so I hope this was not too abstract. This, this would be my answer for your question. And um, yeah, thank I'll you. Stop here. Thank you, Jasmine. Um, so the, the question that was um, addressed to the whole panel was um, about decolonization um, in Africa. Uh, how independent are countries in Africa that still have colonial institutions, especially countries that still pay colonial tax to France? And what does that mean for the goal to decolonize? But if you mm. if you need some time to think about, I can. Um, ask Faisal to respond and maybe we yes, can. Yes, yes, please, sorry. Okay. Just... Faisal, would you? Okay, um, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I think this is an important um, um, issue. Um, so, yes, the, the French example, I think is more grotesque, you know, it's more in your face. Uh, but, but if you, even if you look at the, uh, the English speaking countries, um, for example, um, <clears throat> you realize that um, the, 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 the fact that um, um, African countries uh, had to uh, quickly um, resort to um, loans from the IMF and the World Bank, let's say 10 years after 
after, after independence, uh, tells you something about the structural limitation of the kind of decolonization that happened, right? Um, that, you know, many people, for example, will say it was flag independence uh, because there is this dependency that was woven into the economic relations, you know, that, 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 that succeeded colonialism. And I think what is also important here is the, the role and outlook of the African elites, right? Um, so they are in no way innocent in, in this. Um, so, and I'll give you an example. The, the, the richest person in Africa is called Ali Kotangote. You know, he's from Nigeria. He's richer than anybody living in England, you know, richer than anybody living in England. Um, but, but the structure of his ownership, you know, of, of major uh, things from cement to rice production across Africa is linked to the, the structure of Nestle on, on, on the continent. So, so you see this, this, this relationship of transnational capital with local elites, um, and, and you can take, say, the mining sector across the continent, you know, during the phase of structural adjustment, we went through this privatization phase. And so what you saw was major corporations like Anglo Gold, you know, we partner with a certain band of local elites, you know, to, to corner one, one major mine, pollute the entire area with cyanide, people cannot drink water from there. So, so, so it's a major question, and I think that is why the question of, 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 of political economy is central to this decolonization uh, discussion, you know? Um, it's not just about people changing their outlooks, you know? Um, it, it's about the, the underlying structure of value extraction um, based on which people are ordinarily ranked, based on which relationships of subordination, you know, emerge um, uh, 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 therefrom. And in terms of the, the how, you know, because that question has a how component, you see, there was a generation of, of people in Africa who felt decolonization happened, you know, 1994, the last state South Africa was free, you know, we are free. And so when young people on the continent begin to talk about decolonization, they go like, but that happened way back, you know? And for me, that is hopeful because young people are saying, no, this is an intolerable condition. Right. Um, if you remember, Macron was in Burkina two years ago, went to Dakar, you know, young people on campuses confronted him. Some of them had to be taken out of the halls saying, no, we want to leave this, 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 this or more thing. You know, um, we don't want to keep reserves. Yes, in Dakar, but we know it's, it's not controlled out of Dakar. Right. So 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 you have a new consciousness, the young and um, candidate who contested Maki Sall at the election, the, the central pillar of the campaign was, 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 was French domination. That was the central pillar of the campaign. And he actually nearly defeated Maki Sall. You know, so, so I think you have this wave of young people on the continent who are really saying, no, this is, this is not the way to go. And more importantly, they're not just thinking of decolonization in terms of a flag, they're thinking of it in the epistemic sense, in the economic sense. And for me, that is useful. So yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Thank I, you, Faisal. Oh, sorry. Yes, please, Jenna. Yes, Faisal. I just, I just want to piggyback on a lot of what you just said. And for me, uh, the idea of juridical constitutional decolonization or flag, flag independence, I, I think of more the term self-determination and thinking about how African and and my focus is usually in the Caribbean, questions of how, particularly in the 1960s and 70s, prior to the, the debt crises of the 80s, and then we saw the IMF and structural adjustments and so on. The 60s and 70s is a hub of activity in Africa, in, in the Americas, about questions of self-determination. And the, the question of political economy is constantly raised. And one of the key issues was this idea of the structural limitations that Faisal mentions. And what I found interesting, I, I look at the work of the New, the New World Group. It's a, it's a group of political economists in, in the Caribbean region. And they sought to proffer this idea of delinking, right? This idea of delinking from the international financial arrangements because they saw it as these extractive, uh, extractivist ecologies, right? It, it, it's this idea of a plantation logic, 
as they saw the, the former colonies as simply spaces for which to extract. And they, in turn, sought systems within not only the education system, but economic systems and so on, of how to cultivate. So they wanted to move from a system of extraction to a system of cultivation and what that would look like. And that promise has not been fulfilled. As I said, you have by the 1980s the debt crisis and the conversation shifted. But I think a return to that moment of the 60s and the 70s and those questions of self-determination in its epistemic form, as Faisal mentioned, but also in its cultural and, po and political economy form is also, I think, really a, a key resource for us to reflect on this question of a broader decolonization for Africa and for other former colonies. And I'll end there. Well, ending on the note of a broader decolonization for Africa and other former colonies is a, a perfect way of rounding it up. And I'm sure there would be more uh, both energy and, and time and kind of uh, will to discuss. But unfortunately, we have to close here so to give um, people time and space to move to the next building. So um, I will end by thanking our panelists again for wonderful presentations and a very dynamic discussion. And our audience also for um, the patience of listening to all of this um, in virtual space and still engaging physically, mentally, and emotionally. Thank you so very much and um, see you in the next panel or keynote and see you hopefully all together physically um, for another round of this wonderful discussion. Thanks. <laughs>